Today for our treasures reflection, I'm calling this the Don't Wait to Celebrate Entry podcast, whatever you want to call it. Um, as you may know, if you follow me on social media, I love to hashtag Don't Wait to Celebrate. A really big thing because as we will unpack everything is worth celebrating and not just the outcome the process and all of our lives and stories so let's get to treasure hunting together um this is based on reflection 47 don't wait to celebrate and reflection 68 saving the good stuff so by the time you are listening to this I will have just celebrated my 42nd birthday. I never would have imagined this is what my life would look like at age 42. I'd argue I have even more reason to celebrate than if my life had turned out exactly according to plan, however. Can I let you in on a surprising truth about surviving a season of suffering? Celebration is one of the most powerful defenses we can develop against despair. My friend Brad Montague calls this way of living a joyous rebellion. So I like to tell anyone in our HH family, which is all of you if you're listening, and all our campers, and just anyone in my world, that we get to be joy rebels and get to rebel joyfully. I love that from Brad and um, from Catherine Wolf now. <laughs> I've said this so much, it's got to be mine too. That we are called to be joy rebels, just combating the darkness with joy. Um, now, celebration is not a magic fix all. Your problems won't go away if you throw a party. But celebration does have the power to reinforce our hope and to replenish our resilience so we can engage our pain differently and honestly engage our pain and suffering better because we've celebrated in the midst of it. So let's talk together about three ways that intentionally choosing to practice celebration has changed the way I suffer, and I pray will change the way you suffer. Number one, celebrating is not the opposite of mourning. We are pretty good at applying this thought when a loved one dies. Think about it. Funerals are often called celebrations of life which is so beautiful. And think about it. After most funerals I've been to, there's some sort of party. There's some sort of gathering with food and fellowship. And you're kind of doing this weird celebrating in the deepest of mourning after a funeral time. It's a really powerful thought that um, we only mourn losing what we loved having. You may remember, um, if if you're reading um, Instagram copy on one of the first Instagrams we posted about treasures or reflection, um, the verbiage on that entry writes that what is grief, but what is not grief, but leftover love. And I think that's really powerful that we only mourn that which we really loved. Um, But we don't really apply that same logic to other parts of our life, do we? Especially when it comes to our own disappointments and detours during the time we are actually alive. Um, The first person I ever really saw live this out was my dear friend, Sarah. When Sarah's dad was diagnosed with cancer, she and her family responded in a way I never would have expected. They threw a tribulation celebration. Her family intentionally gathered together with food and drink and laughter, but mostly with tears. They mourned her father's diagnosis and the loss of his good health, 
while celebrating that she was not doing it alone. They recognized what remained, that they had God and they had each other. We think celebration and mourning are opposites, don't we? But they can and they should happen at the same time. They can coexist beautifully in all of our lives, in all of our lives. So for you, listener, where do you see opportunities for both mourning and celebrating in your life right now? And listener, how can you honor what should be mourned without ignoring what should be celebrated? This is a very powerful thought. Don't ignore what should be celebrated because of the mourning. It can be both. Okay, number two. We can celebrate the process and not just the outcome. So I took Sarah's tribulation celebration and began a tradition of brokenness brunches. Some of you may already know of this. It's, um, it's a big thing for me. I gather a few friends who are in seasons of significant suffering for a big, delicious, brunchy meal around my table. We share our stories with each other. And honestly, this in and of itself is cathartic because there's so much healing in telling your story to empathetic listeners. I will do a separate whole podcast, maybe a podcast series, um, at least an episode about the power of truly listening and staying in the hard stories. It's just so, so, so healing. I've recently started a suffering club um, where we do that. We practice not making it okay, letting people tell their really hard stories, listening with real deep empathy, and not putting a bow on it afterwards. Just hearing it and hearing it again and again. Because one of our deepest fears is, is someone will get sick of it. They'll get tired of our story and leave. And um, we want to do the opposite of that. But I digress, and the Suffering Club entry will be at a later date. Back to the brokenness brunch. Um, I do these brunches selfishly, honestly, because I want to enjoy um, J. Wolf frittatas and a whole lot of yummy pastry and tons, gallons of hot coffee. Um, Jay Wolf makes a crazy frittata. Oh my goodness. Um, I could spend an hour talking about them. I'll spare you. But essentially, I'll sum it up with what is my very favorite frittata that he makes that you all should make and have around your table. Basically, frittata is a brilliant breakfast treat because it's so easy. You throw in whatever's in the fridge, add some eggs, bake it up, and it's amazing. It's like a crustless quiche, but much better. Um, so, okay, my very favorite is when Jay takes sage and butternut squash, and that's kind of the base of the crust of the frittata. Then he adds smoked turkey, maybe even a little bacon, and goat cheese. Oh my gosh, you have never tasted something so amazing in all of your life. So, yeah, well, Jaguar frittatas can become listeners' frittatas when you start doing this. And paired with a delicious pastry of your choosing, I love cinnamon rolls and lots of hot coffee, you've got like an amazing, amazing brunch. If you want to get fancy and add a fruit salad, Go for it. And maybe even throw in some mints in that fruit salad. And it gets really, really fabulous and fancy. And um, yeah, whoa. Make make a big delicious brunch. I'm getting hungry even talking about it. Like that's delicious. Um, okay, anyway, sorry, I digress again back to the actual brokenness brunch and what really matters. And let's be honest, even though I deeply love food, it really doesn't matter. It's about who's around the table and what they're saying. Um, as I listen to stories around our kitchen table, I found that I don't dig deeper into despair. Instead of a pity party, 
we're each invited into a posture of perspective when it comes to God, when, sorry, when it comes to our own circumstances and even praise for what God is doing in each one of our stories. And that's why a brokenness, Roger, whatever you want to call it, is so important to invite people with varied types of suffering. We're all going through the same thing. If all of our husbands left us, then that's almost can create comparison. But if it's somebody whose husband's left and somebody who has a child with special needs and somebody who's walking through bankruptcy and this diversity of hardship is just glorious because you're not comparing you're just waking up to the suffering of others and listening just so intently to their story and letting it inform how you think about your story and there's a lot of really brilliant people like dan allender adam young who are writing about the new neural pathways, the new neural pathways that are created uh, by this process and how brilliant it is actually. And I didn't really do it for any of those reasons, but um, it's very powerful. I celebrate the process of life in some other unconventional ways too. So every April 22nd, when my family and I remember quote unquote, Catherine lived day, which is the day after the stroke. I had the stroke on April 21st, but since it was a 16 hour brain surgery to save my life, I went into surgery. I think it was like 6 PM or something on the 21st. And I came out 16 hours later on April 22nd. So that's the day April 22nd became Catherine live day. And honestly, this day is, Weird, complex, for sure. And yeah, it just brings out a lot of just strange emotions. Um, there was no closure to or tidiness to my story. Um, you know, if it was like a one and done car wreck and we celebrated the anniversary that I lived, that could be kind of a cooler version. But the reality is, um, you know, I have ongoing neurovascular issues and the anniversary of the AVM. It's kind of also the anniversary of waking up that all is not well in Catherine's brain. So it's, it's a weird day for sure. Um, there's a lot to worry about in my life. And this day is kind of an annual reminder. There's a lot to worry about. However, if we wait for the happy ending and the hoped for outcome to celebrate in our stories, we'll stay in a holding pattern for most of our lives. I know I would. So instead, we can each choose to celebrate the refining that's happening in our story right here, right now. The small wins and provisions, the opportunities for trust and expansion. In this way, Celebration becomes a form of worship. We can blur that line between the party and the pulpit. Okay, friend, let's do a little party planning together, okay? First, think of a friend or two or three or four even who might need some help celebrating their process today. Now, Let's scheme a super simple way that you could gather them together. Choose what works for you, honestly. You can go to the brunch, go to the brunch route like I did, or you can meet for dinner or go to a beautiful park, go on a walk, have coffee together. Don't overthink it. Just gather. Whatever. So send the text, make the plan, set this celebration into motion. Tell your friends that Catherine has prescribed a party and that y'all are going to find a way to celebrate the process together. I know you likely do as well, but I have a number of sweet friends walking through exceptionally hard things in this season. 
And I want so much to do stuff. I want to do things. I want to take them things. I want to say the right thing. And we just overthink all of it so much. Just presence. Just gather. Just be in the midst and and listen and love on them. Maybe feed them some delicious frittata, but maybe just um, be a listening ear. You know, I, I like to say less words are the best words. You may have heard me say that. That um, we don't need to talk so much. There will be a time for all the deep truth, for sure. But in the moments of fresh pain, I think the route is not truth, but tears. It's letting the tears speak that I'm with you. And I am also deeply saddened and quite shocked by this happening to you. And, um, that's really what we all want, isn't it? So let's let's give each other a proper reason to do this. Have a brunch or a gathering of some kind and just grieve the losses together. So point three, we can choose to truly live even when we feel like we are dying. So Jay and I got married in the deep south where weddings are very serious business. Okay, this is a fact. It is a tradition in the South to display all of your wedding gifts for literally months and months on end so that friends and neighbors and family can come into your house, view everything you've received, like some very weird museum exhibit, and ooh and ah about all the pretties in your house. We received an overwhelming amount of beautiful gifts from our generous friends and family. Shortly after we married, we struck out on an adventure and moved to Los Angeles, California. And we honestly still don't totally know why we did this. We just wanted an adventure when we were young and probably kind of clueless and stupid, <laughs> but it was really fun. And um, we owned... No furniture whatsoever, but still had to rent a huge U-Haul truck to carry a percentage of the wedding gifts to California. Plenty were left in my parents' basement, but plenty made the cut to take to California, um, which is kind of hilarious. And as we unpacked into our first tiny little apartment, I remember pulling out so many wedding gifts and thinking... I'll save this for a special occasion, or we can use this when we have a real house and real jobs and become grown-ups. And little did I know that all those wonderful gifts would still be sitting in the back of our closets, gathering dust when I nearly died. Jay would pack them up by himself, all still unused, as he moved our life out of that first apartment and into a residential neuro rehab. So I spent about a year living in hospitals. But one special day, I was given a pass to spend the night at home with Jay and James. Jay had the idea to unearth some Egyptian cotton sheets from our wedding that were beautifully embroidered with our new, um, what do you call that, monogram, and make up the bed for me. It was really sweet. We were renting a house right next to the neuro rehab facility. And let's just say it wasn't exactly, you know, a Southern living um, photo. So I couldn't eat. I couldn't walk. I couldn't take care of my son. But sleeping on those sheets made me feel like I was a little bit alive. Once I could officially move into that house, I was eating breakfast in bed every day because I couldn't walk to the kitchen, so Jay was bringing it back, and it was on those fancy sheets. Woohoo! I'm lounging in bed with breakfast and fancy sheets. Now, I should tell you, I wasn't officially eating yet. So when Jay started bringing me coffee in bed at my request, it was mainly just me smelling it and like dipping my tongue in it, which is so sad. Um, and slowly as the months went by, 
I requested Jay get um, my favorite kid cereals. So like think Fruity Pebbles or something, pour milk in, let it kind of turn into like a sugary cereal slop. And then I would try to slowly eat like a couple little tiny, tiny nibbles. Um, so my breakfast wasn't exactly, you know, the, the fabulous brunch I was speaking of earlier. Instead, it was like mashed up slop, um, sugar cereal, and maybe dipping my tongue in coffee. But hey, it was breakfast in bed on those fancy sheets. And it was really honestly magical for me. Um, I felt like I was waking up and enjoying um, the Ritz Carlton every morning, both room service at the Ritz every morning, and then headed out to my seven hours of therapy at the Brain Rehab. So while many people at the Brain Rehab were inpatient, and I had been for a long time, I, for almost a year, had the incredible incredible opportunity to live in my um, fabulous spa-like breakfast in bed dream situation and then be brought over. Jay would wheel me over to the therapy center. Um, so there was so much healing even in those moments of um, enjoying those fancy sheets. Anyway, enough about me. Listener, are you saving any good stuff in your life for later? When do you think later will finally arrive? Because honestly, for me, it almost didn't arrive. I often catch myself with the stingy impulse to save the good stuff for when real life begins. Withholding the good stuff means for some reason... I don't believe that my life here and now is worthy of beauty, care, and delight. And what an insult that must be to the God who gave it to me in the first place. But the truth is, my life is worth the good stuff. Even more so than any later that may be ahead for me, right here, right now. For me, Really living looks like sleeping on the good sheets, eating from our writing china, even on an ordinary Tuesday night, burning the nice candles when there are no house guests to impress. When we moved back to Georgia from California 14 years later, we had a free yard sale before we left. And we created a free store in several rooms of our house and in the yard. And shout out to Mary Austin and Alex, my amazing sister-in-laws who helped pull this off. Basically turning our little house into a free boutique where we very, very like beautifully displayed um, all our tchotchka so that people could come load up and have no price tag on it. And I should say, this was an invite-only yard sale. So what we got to do, and once again, I would highly recommend this, is invite people we know could really use this stuff. We didn't just put the word out to the neighbors. We intentionally invited people who we knew, for one reason or another, would really, really be blessed by getting to come Shop for free. We invited um, single moms and people in all areas of life who could use a boost with some cool things. We actually invited a lot of single people who, whether the singleness was wanted or unwanted, um, had not had a wedding. So they were going to leave with some of my wedding things. And I just found so much joy in seeing sweet um, acquaintances or friends walking to their car with like my crystal <laughs> and, you know, different special things, pla fancy platters or, or whatnot. It was, um, it was a really special, special day. I'll never forget it. And yeah, I'm really grateful for it. I pray that they are using all of that stuff daily. 
and not waiting to celebrate, but celebrating the right here, right now, um, special stuff in their lives. The parties and the goodies aren't vain indulgences to me, although they could become that in a different context for sure. They are little rebellions against hopelessness. Remember how I talked about there were all joy rebels? So yeah, we're going to have rebellions against hopelessness. They are a symbol that my story is worthy of celebration. And so is yours, friend. God has given us these moments, these days. We're here. We're in this story. We are alive. And that is worth celebrating. Beloved, Will you join me in stewarding our suffering well by celebrating the lives we have, not the ones we thought would be? Because that's exactly what the world could use most. Every last one of us will suffer someday. So nothing could be more useful than seeing it done well. So let's show off some fabulous celebration in the midst of deep, pain. Gratitude for the process, not just the outcome. Radical ownership over the stories we've been given. Radical ownership of the stories we've been given. God has given us our stories, and we must respond with celebration. We've been granted another day on this planet. We are in the land of the living. Let's celebrate that we're here in the process of all of our lives. So be sure to pre-order the book wherever books are sold and sign up to get all the freebies on treasuresinthedark.com. And I will hope to see you soon. God bless you, friend.